So, good afternoon. It's afternoon already started like two minutes ago. Uh, I am the Czech ambassador to the United States in Ekmoniček. It's my pleasure to bring to the United States uh, the group of the four people, one of them renowned Egyptologists of the Czech Republic, Professor Barta, Professor Kovács from uh, the Charles University, uh, our Brigadier General of the Special Forces currently, assigned to the most eastern division of NATO, uh, General Zrechka uh, and Colonel Fultin, and uh, we call them in diplomacy, this group, the Apocalypse. Uh, we call them like that because they, they, they study for a number of years the reasons of the growth and collapse of systems, regimes, uh, and civilizations as such. Basically, uh, they are thinking in a military and philosophical way about the things we diplomats uh, talk a lot without having the scientific basis, matrix, knowledge of the things. I've just came from uh, the State Department where we had our consultations about the state of affairs uh, in North Korea, where the Czech Republic has the embassy and the full-fledged ambassador, the colleague of mine. And believe me, a lot of the talk was about the collapse. And it was very close to your agenda as we concluded on the basic question, where will North Korea collapse, that North Korea already collapsed, just they didn't notice because collapse is also the way of uh, your perception. So, again, it's very much what you will offer us today, which I understand is three lectures on, on the topic from uh, the different points of view uh, and the discussion, uh, which basically depends on uh, your questions. Uh, and let me just conclude with, with thanking uh, to Professor Yunak Alexander and his Potomac Institute, uh, because without them we would not have a place to tell you something about the collapse and apocalypse. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Tom? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Tom O'Leary, the Executive Vice President here at the Potomac Institute for Policy Study. On behalf of Michael Swetnam, our Chief Executive Officer, and General Al Gray, our Chairman of our Board of Regents, I'd like to welcome our distinguished panel and all of our visitors here today. And also I'd like to make a special uh, thank you to the Embassy of the Czech Republic for providing the refreshments today, so thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. I think today's topic is really gonna be an interesting discussion on punctuated equilibria. Um, it's been a, a, a topic of theory for a long time, but I think what will make this panel discussion unique is it blends both the theory with reports from the field. So I think that will be good. So we'll have the theory and the ground truth. So I'm looking forward to it. I know you are too, so I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Professor Alexander so we can get on with the program. And again, welcome to everyone. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Tom. I'm going to be also very, uh, very, very brief because uh, we're looking uh, forward um, to our colleagues uh, sharing uh, with us uh, both professionally on, on the human, uh, human face, uh, their views on this very important uh, subject. Uh, we are indeed uh, very honored to uh, have the uh, opportunity to welcome the uh, members of the Czech Republic uh, Embassy, the ambassador and his uh, colleague, um, uh, as well as the uh, members of the Czech uh, delegation, both academic and, um, and military. And particularly, I, I must stress, for us it's a extraordinary honor because uh, at this point um, we benefit from the uh, celebration of the 100th 
uh, anniversary of the establishment of the Czech Republic in Czechoslovakia and uh, under the uh, leadership of um, the founder of Masaryk and so on. So we're looking forward to our discussion today, but uh, hopefully uh, we are uh, looking forward for further engagement and uh, academic uh, cooperation uh, in the future um, with uh, the Czech Republic, uh, as well as uh, our colleagues um, in the EU and NATO and actually around the world uh, dealing with uh, some of the security uh, challenges. Um, one personal uh, footnote, I, I had the opportunity um, to follow, to be a participant observer of uh, the situation, uh, not only um, in, uh, in Europe, but around the world, but particularly uh, with the Czech Republic during the um, Second World War and uh, the Cold War and the post-Cold War uh, period. And um, uh, particularly, I'd like to, to mention the uh, opportunity that uh, we academics uh, had uh, going back with uh, the Charles University, partic particularly the Faculty of Law, the Political Science, and um, other co colleagues. And uh, we certainly would like to uh, welcome uh, our speakers today. Uh, you will have some information about their background and uh, hopefully they can also share with us some of their uh, personal uh, experience uh, related to to the topic. So um, I, I suggest that uh, they begin with uh, their presentation and their PowerPoint. I went over the PowerPoint. I must tell you that I was so impressed that I believe that on the basis of the information that I've seen from our four speakers, I would recommend uh, to have a special course uh, that would be mandatory uh, in uh, the uh, academic uh, community graduate and uh, also in, in the military. Um, since we are contributing, however modestly, to NATO as academic uh, advisors um, and particularly related to the weapons of uh, mass uh, destruction and terrorism. By the way, for the ambassador, I have for you the, our latest uh, publication on biological uh, terrorism. What are some of the uh, roadmaps uh, for uh, strategies in the future, uh, the refugee crisis, and the role of the military? So this is all yours, and uh, we would be delighted to share with you some of our academic work in this area. So, uh, Professor Barta, why don't you um, begin first, okay. and then your colleagues will follow, okay? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me well? Okay, good. Before starting with the talk itself, um, I would like to use the opportunity of being the first speaker um, to thank the Potomac Institute um, for the floor, for the opportunity, and especially to Professor Jonah Alexander and our ambassador to the um, United States of America, Mr. Hinek Monicek, uh, for organizing this um, exceptional event for us. Um, as has been already indicated, our talks will all more or less dwell on the punctuated theory, punctuated equilibria theory, and the long-term data and their relevance to our modern um, world and perspective, um, perspective disciplines of our specialization. Um, we will, or at least I will, uh, try to demonstrate that um, long-term um, data analysis and uh, punctuated equilibria theory may be excellent and even, um, at least in my personal view, um, of strategic 
importance for our understanding of what is um, in happening all around us. It was already um, General Mattis who uh, draw attention to history and um, historical data and their relevance for our modern world. He often quotes from Ecclesiastes 1.9, um, this is a sentence, there is nothing new under the sun. And his comment on this reads as follows. I will just quote a couple of sentences. Read about history and you become aware that nothing starts with us. It started long ago. And further, you recognize there is nothing so unique that you've got to go to extraordinary lands to deal with it. So this is just a, a mild opening for this talk. Um, this is um, what, what war used to be until, until recently. It's clearly um, defined enemies, um, battlefields, regions of conflicts, etc. And this, in my view, is what we've been facing more and more in our contemporary world. It can be libraries. We can fight battles on boats. We can fight battles in our cities. And even we can, buy, uh, we can uh, face battles um, in natural environment. This, the, the picture on the left corner here is Greenton, Greenland and the mel melting um, melting ice that uh, is going to influence um, the modern geopolitics um, in a couple of years. My basic thought I wish to convey through this presentation is as follows. Military of the 21st century, and pardon my amateurish um, remarks, with regard to military, is not any more largely isolated entity designed to fight enemies and conflicts with clear contours and unbiased setting in space. Now, more than ever before in our history, military should be an integral part of a given society, profiting from it, and at the same time being limited in, in performance and intelligence by the, set, by the set of norms, quality of institutions, level of complexity, which is a very important phenomenon cost of energy and implicit law on which a given society operates. The multipolar world, the dynamics of development and technological progress in particular, in combination with bold changes of natural environment, are the reasons we should pay attention to reliable evidence and long-term data sets when writing future scenarios and getting ready, preparing ourselves for the specific challenges of the days to come. One of the few ways how to reach a significant level of reliable knowledge represent the long-term trends, trends explaining the dynamics of change and punctuated equilibria theory clarifying the nature of such changes. And this is going to be the subject of my talks for the next 20 or 25 minutes. These are, in my opinion, um, some basic issues on which um, modern conflicts of today's are based on. They rely on nature of the climate change, historical embedding, of course, though funny it may seem, ongoing social processes, technological progress, religious and cultural practices, crisis of values of identities, and defunct, defunct elites. Not only innovations, because we, we tend to venerate technological progress, uh, as, it, as we go day by day, but it's not only innovations, but specifically a broad scope for better and comprehensive understanding of now and us, which should be sought for. Without the knowledge of the whole social system, we are prone to failure, to misjudgments of the processes which operate our or any given society. Therefore, our data pool is considerably bigger than we usually tend to use. It can be ancient civilizations that lasted for millennia. It can be modern British Empire that collapsed in the 1950s within a couple of months. It can be South American civilizations. It can be Western Europe. It can be even United States. In this talk, it will be demonstrated that civilizations develop mostly along common denominators in other words, there are 
probably seven laws that co govern development, rise and fall and transformation of any given civilization. This is one thing. Crisis and collapse, meaning not disappearance of a given civilization, but basically principle and sudden leap-like loss of complexity are an integral part of any social development and a very important stage in systems restart. So if you understand this crucial stage in any social evolution, we can, we can um, quite well prepare ourselves for the, for the transformation period and for the restart. And there is never just one single factor causing crisis or problems of the system. The collapse or transformation is always the result of an interplay of a series of in internal and external factors, and crisis and collapse are always approaching in a nonlinear, punctuated way. And this is especially important. The factors that cause collapse are not unique. They are present in the incipient stage of the system. So if you want to understand why a given system is in a critical stage, you have to go at the very beginning of the of the system and to analyze how it came into being and how it started to pro proliferate. So that's one of the laws that we call Heraclitus law. And the consequences, military becomes more than ever in the past not only a fighting system, but increasingly a force stabilizing and securing development in the environment it belongs to. This is just a very simplified chart that shows basic subsystems of a given society based on subsystems or economy, legitimacy and institutions, governance and knowledge. And all this is framed by external framework that we call environment. And we can't override this particular aspect of the analysis. The internal, the internal processes can be to a certain degree moderated. This doesn't apply, however, for the environmental issues. The theory of punctuated equilibria goes back to 1972 and is associated with this famous scholar. And you can see that he was really famous because he made it into Simpsons. Um, Stephen Jay Gould, um, Harvard natural scientist, who uh, discovered a beautiful geological section years ago. And of course, he started his, his heart started to beat fast because he expected a Darwinian evidence how the um, fascists that, that he was observing in the profile would change, you know, step by step and develop in time. This was, however, not the case. What, what, what he could observe is, was a long-term, long period of stability without any apparent change. And then all of a sudden, there was a very short, brief leap period during which all organisms changed completely. So that's how he started to coin the theory of punctuated equilibria. As I said already, it's a theory that originates in evolutionary biology, which proposes that most social systems develop along a sustained trajectory of seemingly uneventful development, punctuated by sudden complex changes. This is what he observed in this geological section. And in combination with multiplier effect, which is another archaeological theory developed in Great Britain in 1972, changes or innovations occurring in one field of human activity or in one subsystem sometimes act so as to favor changes in other fields or other subsystems. And the multiplier effect is said to operate when these induced changes in one or more subsystems themselves act so as to enhance the original changes in the first subsystem. So these two aspects combined together give you quite a powerful tool how to see long-term data, long-term historical processes. And by saying historical, I mean everything that happened from, from now backwards. Everything we can predate is basically history. And the longer the evidence is, the better. Punctuated equilibria from history, the fall of Rome, which happened basically in 30 or 40 years. 1989 in Eastern Europe, just a factor of couple of couple of weeks. Um, or the fall or collapse of Great Britain in 1951-52 when they lost most of their territories um, out of Britain. Uh, punctual equilibria 
as a phenomenon was not discovered only in natural sciences, but also in uh, environment. Here you can see how um, quickly can climate change within time. And also in economy, here's a reference to article by Price and others from, from 2011. Of course, the economists don't, don't read too often. So for the lack of, uh, for the lack of um, terms, they call it switching processes. And again, they discovered that what operates the fluctuating prices in commodity markets, in the commodity markets is not a Darwinian linear thing, but they, they are happening in a major, major leaps. So this gives us some evidence to think that punctual equilibria is something universal, governing both um, nature and human societies, because economy, and of course army as well, are just functions of the society in which they develop. The four elements of military revolutions, or so-called punctual equilibria, consist of, and now I refer to Krepenevich article from, uh, from um, 1994, it's technological change, systems development, operational innovation, and organizational adaptation. So here again, focusing on military, we have these four subsystems that interact with each other, and what happens is punctuated equilibria again. It was defined by Rogers in 1993, and after him by Krepinevich, and quite recently it has been um, again a revival of this theory in American arm, as you know much better than um, me. Um, next to punctuated equilibria, what also really matters is the theory of cycles, that, which are basically complementary. Just one reference to Peter Turishan article from 2012, who postulates the existence of a 50-year-long cycle based on American history, when he refers to major periods with high number of critical conflicts, which he, he, which he dates back to 1870s, 1920s, 1970s, and then, and this will be the test for the theory, around 2020. So we will be able to observe if the theory is reliable or not within two or three years. Internal dynamics in any society is very important and it gives you this powerful tool that you can predict a incoming major change or set of changes that will happen in a leap way manner. So in but focusing on internal dynamics, <laughs> we have brokers and quality of institutions, social contract and implicit law, the role of the elites, Heraclitus' law, which basically says the reversion of positive factors into negative ones, and technologies and energy return on investment, which is yet another very important phenomenon. Um, here we have institutions. There's no doubt that at the beginning of any complex society, high-profile, um, dynamic institutions, bureaucratic institutions, bureaucracy, etc are very important. Without um, well-performing institutions, you, you can't have any progress in time, in the complexity, etc. What is also important is maintaining social contract and how you re redistribute power and wealth and how you share it. If the elites start to perform less and less well, if they try, if they start to ignore the majority of population, at the end you will lose the show, social contract and then the legitimacy of the elites expires and you can't face any major, any major crisis because the elites always need support of the major population. The peak of any given social system is reached when you attain a critical level of complexity, which means you basically use all your resources just to maintain the level of your complexity. What is a level, what is a critical level of complexity? This is a very low level of complexity in very simple terms. This lady living in the Northern Territory has this mat, and on the mat are all her artifacts she was using for millennia in, in the Northern Territory. The Aborigines culture is roughly 50,000 years old. So this is one level of complexity. And this is 
another level of complexity. Um, I go back to Lee's article in 2014 that deals with the American law as a court, as a code. It's called a software engineering approach to analyzing the United States code dating back to 2014. It shows quite clearly that especially during the two last decades there was an explosion of a complexity in the American legal system. You can see two charts. The one on the left is the size of the US legal code in terms of number of wars included in every single legal code. And on the right you can see a chart that shows basically the same and it's based on the number of conditional statements. And here you can see it, re it resembles a sort of explosion in complexity. And of course, the more complex system you create, the more energy you need to sustain it. Not talking about any further progress. What happens when the system reaches a critical level of complexity, which means that the resources are more and more limited? You get nepotism, demotization of state administration, plutocracy, family businesses. Already our mission, working, working in Abusir, discovered one of the earliest nepotics in, in our history, Ptah who worked as a hairdresser and was by far the most influential person in the royal court back around 2400 BC. And now to Mancure Olson. He was the person who created a series and published it in 1982, book The Rise and Decline of Nations. And what is the consequence? Deep state. Deep state. And we all know what I'm talking about. Um, just one reference to Francis Fukuyama, article in Foreign Affairs 2014, America in Decay, and two year later, public, uh, one year later publication, Political Order and Political Decay. Just one quick reference. The explosion of interest groups of lobbying in Washington has been, and lobbying in Washington has been astonishing. And now he gives the numbers, 175 registered lobbyists in, back in 1971 compared to about 14,000 lobbyists in 2009. So this shows you how these processes work on a long-term scale. And this happens when, when the system reaches critical amount of complexity and limited, more and more limited resources. Um, Sphere of interest groups today. This is a 2014 Guardian um, article called Masters of the Eurozone. And it's, it's about interest groups. Uh, these are six, how many, six, eight, eight gentlemen from Europe who are in charge of major banking institutions, governments, prime ministers, etc. So guess what, what is their common roof? What, bring, what unites them all? It's very improbable concentration of based on their origin. What do you think? Well, we talk about the sphere of interest groups, right? Huh? It's very simple. Just one bank. Just one bank. It's very improbable. When you, when you look at statistics, all of them originate from Goldman Sachs. It's just one bank. Vetocracy. Beautiful. Beautiful term coined by Fukuyama, and here you have two charts, very simple one, that show you that show you how the punctuated equilibria works. Here on the right you have bureaucracy autonomy, which is a number of people included in the administration and government quality, and a breakpoint over here. And on the left you have number of veto players, checks and balances, and difficulty of decision making. And again, you can imagine yourself what these charts tell you about the society, about the, any given modern society. What is very important, very important in the sphere of punctuated equili equilibria is not only the long-term data, but also the role of individual. It's always about individual. Individuals, leadership. Here are just a couple of examples. Um, John Jacob Esther and ben Benjamin Guggenheim. Their story is well known. And when J James Cameron finished his movie on Titanic, they asked me, they asked him, why have you falsified the true story? And he said, because nobody would believe me today. And what was the story about? These two men were in the first class when Titanic started to think. 
And they accompanied their families to the rescue boats and they returned on board. And the captain said, what are you doing here? You pay for the first class ticket. You are supposed to go back to the rescue boats. They said, no, because there are kids and women from the second and third class. And he said, then you are going to stay here. And they stay there. They stay there. This is the leadership. This is the true leadership. Um, arrow, energy return on investment and technology. When you, peak, when, you, when you reach a s critical level of complexity, you need a new cheap source of energy to make a progress, another leap towards a higher complexity. If you don't have this source of energy, you can't have any progress anymore because you just spent all your energy on maintaining the current level of your complexity. Just quick lessons from history, engine machine, electric car, electricity, nuclear, nuclear energy, um, and oil. We all know what it means. Um, an ROI means energy return on investment. This is a statistic from 2014, which shows you um, how efficient is, how efficient are different sources of energy. Um, of course, it depends on the content, on the local politics of, give, of a given government, etc. But basically, these are the ratios, and they are declining in time. For your, um, for your um, imagination, <coughs> 100 years ago, one, um, one unit invested into oil created 100 units of positive energy, of energy you could use. Now it is roughly 1 to 25. So we are on 25% of what we used to be 100 years ago. And as we will proceed in time, the ratio will be less and less um, optimistic. Heraclitus' law tested on our modern Western society. Here are six pillars um, defined by Neil Ferguson that on which our success as a being Western civilization was created. It's competition, science, private property, consumption, healthcare, and free labor. And I dare to say here that all of them have critical problems as we, as we speak today. All of them. Now let me finish with climate. As I said, the internal processes can be regulated if we are willing to pay the price, if we are willing to accept that something is happening in the society. Whereby climate can't be can't be overridden and is basically our limit for any complexity, for any development. If we don't understand what climate means, what environment what environment means to us, we we are necessarily lost. There is just one chart that shows you how important it is to understand long term trends. It shows rise of temperatures in the northern hemisphere over 130 or 140 years. Do you see any problem? It's 140 years, it's almost four or five human generations. So the evidence is long enough. It shows you there is a major problem with climate warming, right? You agree? This is long-term trend. 10,000 years of Holocene climate development. If you look at the peaks, and the last peak, you can see clearly, yes, we are going to have problem. But even the climate tends to change over time. And there are natural peaks that were not created by men. Of course, now we are contributing significantly to the climate change. But still, we have to see what is happening in a broad context. And this is big picture. That's why it is important, even for the military, I dare to say again, to have a broad and long-term picture, if you really want to understand what is going on. Other, otherwise, otherwise, you end up in a Amos room. It's a famous term from psychology. Basically, you take all real components of a given reality, and you put them together in such a way that the resulting picture is nonsense as you can see yourself from these two examples. Um, historical events and climate. Again, it's very important to understand that changes, major changes in climate can create very important, heavy 
historical consequences that that influence development of many societies over time and space. Here just small examples, little ice ages, etc. Um, very important is this article by Gerald Bond of, about millennial, millennial cycles that we know, for instance, from 4.2 KIA BP event when most civilizations in the Northern Hemisphere collapsed, and it was opportunity for the NATO conference organized back in 1993 published in 1997, third millennium BC climate change and old world collapse. I think that especially George Kukla has been quite famous uh, figure here in Washington in different cycles. So George Kukla was one of them. Another example is 3.2 KIA BP bond event when we can talk about the first massive massive migrations over several continents. So 3,200 years ago, the sea people, the first long-term evidence data, pool of data for um, large-scale migrations. Or 1.6, 1,600 years ago, the, the fall of the Roman, Roman Empire. And quite recently, 1789, the French Revolution that was also triggered by a major climate change, a small climate change, little ice age, that exerted its impact a year ago. So if you look at the last three sentences over here, in 1788, the portion of wages which had to be used for the staple food bread was at, at about 58%. Year later, a, just a year later, it was incredible 88%. Now relate this, what I say, to your wages. Imagine that you would use 88% of your wages just to make sure that you got enough food and bread in your household, 88%. That's why they, this, the third state decided to go out. Arab Red Spring, we all know what triggered Arab Red Spring. We have a long spell of dry period that lasts in the Middle East for 30 years. And in 2010, the global market with the grain collapsed. And of course, this was the trigger that increased the pressure on populations that took to the streets because they couldn't sustain the, the critical problem with the, with the, basic, uh, with the basic issues in, in, food, uh, in food economy. There's just statistics from Syria about aquifers that within 10 years between 99 and 2007, the aquifer number rose by almost 80,000 80, and most of the people took um, took to the cities. Climate and wars, even today you, you meet politicians that say climate has nothing to do with the, the, with the rising number of conflicts in the world. But I'm telling you, it has. If you go back to this study by Jank and others, uh, you can see quite clearly that there is a relationship between climate changes in history and the number of conflicts of any kind that are related to these to these exact periods of critical changes in climate. So um, one, of the one of the last slides shows that um, we may um, also see the end of the, of the Westphalia system that was established in Europe maybe more than 300 years ago due to the environmental and the climate changes as, as the article by Lopez Carr and Jessica Mark in 2005 in 2015 nature uh, shows quite clearly. So here are my conclusions because my time is up. Punctuated equilibria series today, the, in my view, the best suitable model for explaining societal change and development. And it removes problems with linearity and gradualism. It is also a strong tool for mapping the present. Identical factors that originally stimulated development eventually turn into negative <laughs> ones and collapse the system. And the critical factors that may potentially lead to the collapse can be identified at the very beginning of a system's development. The climate change, just to um, address the external factors as well, is always, always a key factor and can't be overridden. Urge that's why there is an urgent need to, re to design adaptation strategies and to improve resilience abilities of the system. And conclusion two, we should pay radically more attention to the wealth of information provided by multidisciplinary research 
and to their interpretative and predicative potential. Only they can produce long-term series of data that are relevant for our decision-making processes. And these directions in research can provide a very detailed anatomy of long-term processes which show that both our present and future are deeply, deeply embedded in the past. It is historical memory which also shows that social systems of any kind are strongly dependent on external factors such as climate change, etc. And the less effective the social system is, the stronger this dependency of the system becomes. Therefore, the punctuated equilibrium model has a strong predictive potential, but it may be also used, um, it may also indicate that the current paradigm um, we've been living in may be facing its limits. And um, why all this, you may ask, and I think that there has been a major shift in understanding the role of army in general. Given the current nature of many conflicts, army is not exclusive battlefield force anymore, at least to me. We can observe dramatically increased role of army in stabilizing governments, in supporting democracies, in providing more secure framework for inhabitants. If the army has to meet the current task and to deal efficiently um, with the dynamics of the contemporary world, armies at least must be able to understand the society in which they operate, its dynamics, as well as external environment. And essentials for today, um, just a distilled um, slide from all I've been talking about before, major changes come about in abrupt all aspects of society encompassing leaps to which military has to react, respond, the key to understand the system in crisis develops in its incipient stage. The incoming leap or puncture is possible to predict due to an increasing instability of the system. And the leap change occurs when all subsystems begin to interact in such a way that they bring the whole system to a completely different equilibrium level. And the more you attempt to attempt, and this is just a hypothesis, but the more you attempt to fix a system exposed to crisis, the quicker the collapse will be. In the near future, the army, again, at least in my view, personal view, will have to understand not only the inner dynamics of a given social system, but again, yet the nature of the changes in nature, yet the nature of changes in environment and their implications um, to men. Thank you very much for your attention. Obviously, your very uh, profound insights triggered a lot of questions and issues. But uh, if it's okay with you, we'll proceed with All our other yes. colleagues, yeah. and later on we'll uh, develop a discussion. So I, I think uh, we would like to have uh, Professor Kogar to make his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the invitation to this seminar, namely for Professor Jonah Alexander and His Excellency Inek Moniček. <coughs> I will speak about, as you see, collapses that have been changed the modern world and about theory of punctuated equilibrium in practice. In his lecture, uh, Professor Bart has already explained his punctuated equilibrium theory, and he also mentioned some recent yet already classic examples of this theory in practice. Now, allow me to look in detail together with you at three fateful historical turns, which, in my opinion, correspond with the story in some respects. 
I will speak about the collapse of Bourbon France and the whole Europe at the turn of the 18th and the 19th centuries, about the collapse of European balance of power system, and eventually uh, I will speak about the collapse of Soviet bloc and the Communist Soviet Union at the turn of the 1980s and 1990s. In the end of my lecture, in the same context, I would like to just only briefly meditate on the situation of today's Western Europe and on one of many threats that we will have to face sooner or later. And I hope that my examples should clearly show where the strength of the story dwells and why it is important for understanding today's world. The first, now already classic example of the collapse of complex society in modern European history was the collapse of Bourbon France and then the whole Western and Central Europe at the turn of the 18th and the 19th centuries. It's typical, completely in the spirit of the punctuated equilibria theory, that nearly nothing, nearly nothing, had initially indicated an imminent catastrophe of such magnitude. Regardless of a series of partial problems, which I will address shortly, the French monarchy appeared stable in all respects, politically, economically, socially, as well as demographically. Therefore, it came Therefore, it came as an even greater shock when the country suddenly found itself in the middle of a deep political crisis in the spring of 1789. The revolt of the commons stood at the beginning of the revolution, a fundamental transformation of all subsystems of society, or said in the words of Professor Miroslav Barta, it was a collapse which didn't mean the end of the world, but which was a sudden end of Western Europe in the form it had existed for the past three centuries. It was not only the fall of the modern French monarchy, uh, it was also the fall of other monarchies of its kind in Europe, a total disintegration of an established social order and establishment of a new social system. It was a failure of most of the spheres of life and functioning of society in the sense of its identity, quality, legitimacy, and the elites and economic performance. There are the most important causes of the French Revolution, this crucial break of modern French and European history. First, a lingering financial crisis of the French state caused also by the fact that the clergy and the aristocracy were in fact exempted from payment of the majority of taxes. Second, this resulted in indebtedness of the French monarchy resolved by further loans, not by attempts of rational economic reform of the system or by the failure of these reforms. Third, it is the fact that France didn't experience an industrial revolution or even agricultural revolution of the English or British type, which coincide with a significant political transformation or democratization of the system. A dramatic crop failure, wine making crisis, soaring prices and unemployment, as well as a severe winter in the pre-revolution year of 1788 as the X factor. Then a long crisis of French Catholic Church, rigidity and inflexibility of French society, about outdated and inflexible administrative and fiscal structure of the monarchy, about corruption of the royal officials and sale of the 
trial offices, about failure of the judiciary and justice reform, about weakened loyalty of the elites towards the crown. We can speak about the end or emptying of the symbolic and emotional investment towards the royal regime. We can speak also about the ensuing weakening loyalty of the elites towards the crown and about subversive influence of the enlightened philosophic propaganda. In the end, about the rising importance of the public opinion and discontent, but not only the commons, industrialists, traders, professionals, and some of urban and village population, and the clear articulation of new ideas regarding the arrangement of society and new political concepts. To sum it up, it was primarily the collapse of political aristocratic elites. We are speaking about the crisis of the French nobility, this tragic epilogue of the slow suicide of the ruling class, uh, as Hippolytine, a French historian, wrote. We can speak also about the inability to evaluate the situation in which the regime found itself. However, just only interconnection of all these factors, just only interconnection of all these factors mentioned above, which alone couldn't, couldn't cause any crisis, caused the fateful distortion of equilibrium. Moreover, simultaneously, the French Revolution started the rise of lower social classes with all fatal consequences. As we can see, the system was changed for reasons that are completely modern and highly topical. The result, the seemingly immortal state was completely destroyed within a few weeks. The second example of the total collapse of complex society is the breakup of European balance of power system and eventually of the whole continent at the beginning of the 20th century. Paradoxically, the European society had probably never seemed as stable as then, despite all of the complicated problems which it encountered in the last quarter of century. It's remarkable that if we carefully study the official diplomatic papers of the last two or three decades before the First World War, or numerous backstage talks and private remarks of the decision makers until the summer of 1914, we will not find any hint of worry that a collapse of similar magnitude might come, much like in the case of the French Revolution. The famous book, The Sleepwalkers, uh, How Europe Went to War in 1914 by Christopher Clark, shows exactly how the elites were caught off guard by the Great War and how completely they failed to understand what had happened to their world in the course of a few weeks and months. The fact that the seemingly fully mentioned and in most respects well-operated organism could collapse like a house of cards and result in an unprecedented catastrophe in a short while was extremely frustrating, not only to the mentioned elites. Practically, throughout the entire war and also in the post-war period, these people looked for an answer to the question of how they could have been so blind and how they could have ignored all the small, inconspicuous, but even greater and greater signs of the approaching collapse. The corpse of European civilization of the fantasy echo had, to put it simply, some great mutually interconnected causes. First, 
long-lasting and sustainable complexity of system of international relations existing already in global world. Complicated ties between great powers and their clients. This is small, seemingly unimportant states. Second, the existence of two alliances opposing each other in most respects. We know triple aliens and Antan. Third, a sharp increase of diplomatic crisis, for example, Fashura incident, Moroccan crisis, Bosnian crisis, and local wars, which repeatedly brought Europe to the edge of collapse. Increased importance of the colonial policy, which could have led to a global catastrophe because of seemingly unimportant clash in an insignificant places uh, somewhere in Africa. Relocation of internal political issues of great powers to the international scene with all of the ensuing consequences. For example, an attempt of Austria-Hungary to resolve its lingering political crisis by victorious war with Serbia. The wrong peace factor, I mean an absence of a really great war between European powers from 1855 to 1914, a birth of modern nationalism, a war as a revolution and a program of new modernism. We could speak about Italian futurists and their manifesto. And an illusion, especially of the young generation, but also of the European political leaders, about the future war. Historians speak about so-called war of illusions. It's a famous book by Fritz Fischer, Krieg der Illusionen. And in the end, coincidence of unfortunate political development in, in summer of 1914, uh, so-called Sarajevo assassination and its consequences. To sum it up again, much like in the case of the French Revolution from the end of the, of the 18th and the 19th centuries, it was again the collapse of European political elites, international elites, their inability to critically evaluate the fact that the system of international relations practically came out of their control, not to mention the utter inability of self-reflection. The penalty which the elites paid for the creation of long-lastingly unsustainable system of international relations was cruel. Not only collapse of Stefan Zweig words of yesterday, but also a birth of George Orwell's sort of future. The world of fascism, Nazism, communism. This is world of modern totalitarianism. The last example of a collapse of complex society, which I have selected for today's seminar, is a disintegration of so-called Eastern Bloc and set in the words of Ronald Reagan, the empire of evil, the communist Soviet Union from the turn of the 1980s and 1990s. Also, in this third case, nearly, nearly nothing indicated this sudden swift collapse. Not even the brightest Western criminologists or the most optimistic representatives of the dissent in the communist countries anticipated something like this in the foreseeable future. Unlike France in the late 18th century, and in contrast with the situation in Europe on the eve of the Great War, there were certain clearer symptoms that communism had no future. But despite this fact, the system looked relatively stable and any deliberations about its potential end oscillated with several decades in the least. Yet the communist leaders in the Soviet Union and in the Eastern Bloc found themselves almost from day to day in the position of men who had to face the consequences of a sudden collapse. What were the main causes of this collapse? A fundamental change of the foreign policy of the United States and its allies to Soviet Union. Uh, we can speak about the end of, or about transformation, or Nixon's, Ford's, and Carter's policy of detente. 
in connection with coming of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Helmut Kohl, and partly uh, François Mitterrand to power. Second, the development of the global economy, for example, the end of oil shocks and high oil prices, which strongly contributed to the partial economic self-sufficiency and relative prosperity of the Soviet Union and its allies in the 1970s. The loss of competitiveness of the centrally directed economies. Stagnation of the living standard of the population and growing disillusion regarding the long-lasting sustainability of the communist system. Actual collapse of a social contract, it is very important, very important. Actual collapse of a social contract between the leaders and the subjects in the sense of we will let you rule in peace and you will let and you will let us live as peacefully and decently as possible. And then, a complete failure of Gorbachev's reform, so-called politics of prehistoric and glasnost. Increasingly frequent repressions of the communist governments towards the individuals or small groups of opponents who were practically unable to threaten them at all. Loss of remains of legitimacy, of the rigid political system built on the power monopoly of a single political party and the repressive state establishment. And of course, the loss of the faith, even among the actual members of the establishment. Absence of will of power, absence of will of power or will for power, it means reluctance of most of the communist elites to keep the system in power even at the price of massive bloodshed, with exception of communist Romania. And of course, a faithful, change, faithful changing of events in the miraculous year of 1989 and inability of the communist political elites react to these events. As we can see, this collapse was again the consequence of total failure of the political elites, which have primarily which were primarily responsible for the collapse of the Soviet Union and the communist countries of the Eastern Bloc. If we consider all three collapses of the complex societies from modern European history, which I have referred to, we have to arrive at a relatively clear conclusion. Apart from the fact that they were utterly unexpected and despite some long-lasting and at first sight inconspicuous factors which had a crushing impact on the given complex society in the end, the main cause of the collapse of these three systems, I have to repeat it again, was a total failure of the political elites and their inability to perceive the gradual accumulation of the crisis potential in the individual subsystems of society as a whole. These conclusions led me in the last part of my paper to a brief meditation over the situation of today's West European society. This is whether similar factors as those that I have mentioned cannot lead together with the blindness of the European political elites to a gradual corrosion of our world and its collapse in the foreseeable future. Without underestimation any or known threats and risks that threaten the present Western civilization, lack of sources, environmental problems, and even demographic uh, development, religious clashes, and so on, I think that the most significant problem is elsewhere. In my opinion, just as at the end of the 18th century in France and at the end of communist era in Central and Southeastern Europe, the main problem of today's Western Europe is the fact that social contract between the rulers and those to whom they rule, this is between members of liberal political elites and great part of West European society, finds itself on the edge of its lifespan. It's not for the first time when the individual European countries have experienced sim uh, something similar over the past 50 years. For example, it came in Italy in the first half of the 1990s or in Austria 
1999 when Jörg Haider's Freedom Party entered government of Organization's People Party, which led to a sharp conflict between Vienna and Brussels. In recent years, the situation had become different and more critical. A great part of West European electorate opposes the establishment. This is existing political system in many countries simultaneously. I can choose from many examples. Austria, where Norbert Hofer, leader of the Austrian Freedom Party, only narrowly lost the presidential election. The Netherlands, where Party for Freedom of Gert Wilders unprecedentedly came second in the parliamentary elections. In France, where Emmanuel Macron, a politician sharply opposing the establishment, established political parties, won the presidential elections, and Marine Le Pen, leader of right-wing National Front, came second. And in Great Britain, where despite recommendations from their political leaders, people decided to vote to leave the European Union. And moreover, one year later, where Labour Party became the second strongest party in the country, with Jeremy Corbyn as a leader who is as similar to the mentioned Hofer or others, although of a different type, a left-wing type. What do all these politicians and their achievements have in common? Three points. All of these men and women strongly defined themselves against the political elites. All of them decided to stand up against the counterproductive and malignant political correctness which has been characteristic to today's Western Europe over the past few years. And all of them profit from the feeling and frustration of people who vote in the free elections dramatically differently from the wishes of the establishment because they are sure that they are abandoned, they are abandoned by their political leaders and their political representatives. We can say that these successful new type politicians, all those host offers, Wilders, Macron, Slopens and Corbins, have one great advantage over the members of the establishment. They have never been, with a few exceptions, a component of the governmental structures, or have otherwise managed to cut off themselves from their activity in the state executive. And they have managed to convince the public that Within the classic division of us and them, they are on the same side as the long-lastingly frustrated part of the electorate. What does, mean, what does this mean for us? Uh, based on historical experience, I dare say they, if the liberal political elites of Western Europe really lose the, through the trust of most of electorate, which has been indicated over the past few years, they will meet with the same end as the political elites at the time of the French Revolution, Europe at the beginning of the 20th century, and maybe communist leaders at the turn of the 1980s and 1990s. If it really happens, it will inevitably lead to another collapse in the spirit of the punctuated equilibria, uh, where however many of us will become the victims together with them. To conclude my lecture, uh, I wish to say that, however naively it may sound, one of the ways preventing this development is that our political leaders really draw a lesson from history. That they are really realize that not only economy and natural science, but also historiography, archaeology, and other humanities or social sciences are, as regards an analysis, of today's situation and prediction of the future development without any exaggeration, strategic disciplines that should be taken seriously by today's decision makers. The fact that we are here among you gives me a small hope that it could be like this. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thank you very much again uh, for your uh, presentation Professor Cover, and uh, the fact is that the two of you, Professor Barta and Professor Cover, presented really an interdisciplinary approach in order to deal with that particular 
issue. And uh, clearly, the uh, historical examples that you gave related to the collapse uh, raise uh, many questions that hopefully we'll discuss. Uh, I think uh, all the way, whether the historical patterns are repeated and what already uh, happened will happen again perhaps uh, someday. But at any rate, we'll discuss it later. Now we are delighted and honored to have a military perspective. Uh, would you like to come up here, B both of you or one of you at a time? Okay, thank you very much. Are we coming? Can you hear me? Okay. Are we coming to the end? So, uh, if you can bear with me, please. For those who won't fall asleep, you can get some candies in the end, in the corner. Uh, well, definitely, uh, I would like to also thanks for uh, being here, uh, Mr. Ambassador and uh, dear professors. It's a real uh, great pleasure and privilege to be here. So, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, Brigadier General uh, Kara Zechka, and together with my colleague, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Otakar Foltin, we'll shortly talk about the relevance of punctuated equilibrium theory for today's military. Our aim is not really to present you any scientific study. That's why we have our professors here, but rather to provide you some of our ideas and observations on this topic from a practitioner's point of view. I will, I hate reading presentations, but I will try to stick to my text to make sure that uh, I keep the timeline. Okay, I'm not going to introduce myself or my colleague. This, these are the badges of our background. Uh, we were already introduced by our Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we're both military, but also apart from being uh, in military service, uh, we also uh, both PhD students in a uh, department of general history uh, of Charles University in Prague yes, and both of us have been a strong proponents of the cooperation between Czech military and uh, academic community. We believe it's not only useful but we believe it's necessary for today military uh, development and this is not our first operation with those professors here and we've done uh, some stuff before together and we also participated on several multidisciplinary publications together. It is also important to mention that what we are presenting here today uh, is our personal ideas and points of view, and it is not the official view of Czech uh, Ministry of Defense or Czech Armed Forces. Okay, throughout this presentation, I use a few quotations, some of them uh, from our real or potential adversaries, which I chose deliberately. It should remind us that we are not the only ones who understand the value of science for military affairs and warfare, and I believe that it should motivate us to be the leaders in the game. Well, this particular inspiring one comes from the Chief of General Staff of Russian Federation, uh, General Gerasimov, and it reminds us of the long-time Soviet and Russian tradition of using science for military purposes. While well, using punctuated equilibrium theory in military history is nothing new. To study the history and development of warfare, uh, it is critical for understanding of current and possible future trends. Nowadays, well-known concept of military revolution or revolutions or in military affairs provides a useful and often used analytical framework for assessing developments in warfare. It was first formulated in 1955 by English historian, and by the way, not a military historian, and he identified a hundred years period uh, of military revolution between 16th and 17th century, mostly related to military and tactical reforms conducted by Maurice of Nassau and Gustavus Adolphus, that's why they're there. And really, he was talking about not only the military technological changes, but also and uh, about the social impacts it had on society, on the social and political aspects of the society. Well, this military revolution concept has become a new orthodoxy, but it was finally challenged and there was a number of other theories developed. 
But what I believe is the real value of the Roberts approach is the holistic approach that covers not only technological or military developments, but also shows the interrelationship with social and political factors similar to Clausewitz's view of Clausewitz's famous trinity. And this provides us with a very useful analytical framework and uh, it, it can enable us to explore and assess developments in warfare better. Well, in 93, a U.S. professor of history, Clifford Rogers, this time a military historian, in his article described uh, a different revolutionary developments starting during the, during the Hundred Years' War in 14th century. In seeking to answer the question, just how did the West, initially so small and so deficient in natural resources, become able to compensate for what it lacked through superior military and naval power? Well, answering these questions, how the West could go so forward from such a weak position by being superior in the military, he came to conclusion that it was rather through the whole series of synergistically combined revolutions rather than the single revolution. And he offers the punctuated equilibrium evolution theory as a suitable conceptual framework to describe this development based on that theory described here before developed in 1970s in the field of paleontology. Well, this approach of the punctuated equilibrium evolution combines both incremental and revolutionary change. Well, looking at the evolution versus revolution dispute, I believe it's a matter of point of view. For example, looking at this picture from my study of, uh, on information warfare, depicting theories of social waves and four generations of warfare, I always get a feeling of revolutionary changes in the development of warfare. But when I look, for example, at this picture, based on the British archaeologist and historian Ian Morris, with longer term view, it looks to me more like incremental and evo evolutionary development. Well, so really, it seems to me that it is more about point of view, and personally to me as a practitioner, this philosophical debate doesn't really matter so much. What matters to me really is to have a sufficient complex and robust analytical tool which uh, we can use and in which I think punctuated equilibrium evolution seems to be. Well, more importantly, because it establishes a pattern of change, it's also predictive in nature, which is really important for military science. And the function of prediction is the key for military science and, as you can see here, in another Gerasimov's uh, quotation. So how will the future warfare look like? Well, if I knew the answer, I would probably be a very rich man by now, which I'm not. So I don't know. But what I can say and what we know is that the environment, the operational environment, security environment is really significantly changing. And we know for sure that we'll operate in very different environment where there will be a lot of people who will be uh, very much interconnected. And technology will probably also have uh, some more developments. Uh, it will have some impacts, but not only technology. Uh, the autonomous systems and artificial intelligence may be some of the key developments, as we can see here in another Gerasimov's quotation. but also some of our own leaders' uh, statements. Uh, well, the bottom line is that we all agree on that we can expect a very different and new era of warfare, and punctuated equilibria can help us indicate when and how the shifts will be coming. We see two major lines in using punctuated equilibrium for prediction in military matters. First is predicting changes in security and operational environment, which is closely linked to the second one, and it's predicting changes in conduct of war. In both cases, the application of scientific approach is helpful and needed. As history shows us, war is a social phenomenon inherent into all human societies. Today's war is not a matter of military, but a matter of the whole state and whole society which, by the way, very few people uh, 
want to understand, uh, in our country at least. Therefore, we can really consider military and warfighting to be social systems. We believe that social sciences, especially study of history, are relevant to predicting developments in security and operational environments. And I will now give the floor to my colleague, Lieutenant Colonel Fultin, to give us some views uh, on the practical use of science in predicting. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that uh, we are a little short of time, so I will not read that. Uh, so please, uh, I'm sorry for mistakes in my English, uh, but uh, I will try to explain uh, what is the problem uh, in uh, uh, persuading our colleagues uh, to understand uh, the above-mentioned uh, theories. Uh, I will try to simplify that, uh, so I'm sorry for uh, any use of uh, sport terminology, but I think that... Uh, uh, we soldiers uh, love football, and uh, most of us, uh, we hate tennis. Uh, why uh, this example? Uh, generally, uh, in the football, uh, we prefer uh, straightforward tactics. Uh, uh, football is just a struggle of uh, will and physical skills. Uh, but compared to tennis, uh, it has a very simple counting. Uh, it means that uh, uh, every point, uh, every goal uh, means that uh, you are nearer and nearer to your victory. And uh, uh, in every moment of the, uh, of the match, you see uh, if uh, you are near or far, or far from, the, from, the, uh, from the point in the end. But compared to tennis, uh, uh, it, uh, the, the tennis is much more complicated and a much more complex uh, game because uh, uh, in some matches uh, you might have uh, less points uh, than the your, let's say, enemy, but uh, even then uh, you may win the match uh, if you uh, win the right points. And uh, because of the complexity and uh, a, little more complica a little more complicated approach uh, in tennis, uh, uh, we don't uh, like uh, to think uh, so much about future conflicts because, uh, like every soldier in the past, we prefer to fight uh, last battles. Uh, uh, when we uh, compare uh, any previous uh, uh, time in military history, we can see that uh, soldiers really prefer some, uh, let's say, very conservative approach. And uh, when we speak, for, for example, about uh, any connections and discussions with our colleagues from academic environment, uh, uh, it complicates uh, our beloved, uh, let's say, uh, symmetric uh, approach uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the war at, uh, at all. Um, I think that the main problem is that uh, we focus on points. Uh, so it means that uh, we like to find uh, any real point, uh, what is the beginning of, uh, of the war, and uh, we like to see, uh, in the end, the clear Result. It means uh, here is the winner. Uh, somebody else uh, is defeated, and uh, and that's all. But uh, uh, believe me, in the future uh, it might happen that uh, uh, we will not uh, realize uh, if the war uh, started, and uh, it might happen that uh, there will be no end of the war, and maybe that we will uh, even not understand that we are already fighting. Uh, so. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, the fact that we focus uh, on, the, on the simple point uh, is the reason why a lot of our colleagues uh, don't want to cooperate with academics because uh, uh, they used to, uh, let's say, complicate uh, the matter at all. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, I think that uh, in this moment we are in such point in the military, let's say, history, uh, where uh, the future operational environment will be so complex and so complicated that uh, definitely we should use uh, not only modern statistics but uh, uh, academics and their, let's say, non-military approach more than uh, uh, any time before. Uh, the situation is changed uh, and uh, uh, even uh, you can think that uh, to uh, complicate uh, the uh, the uh, to complicate the, uh, the theory with uh, another theory might be a little complicated. Uh, it already happened. Uh, for example, the new uh, Russian generation warfare have uh, one of uh, very uh, 
different goals uh, compared to previous uh, wars and uh, uh, it uh, it's not uh, the occupation of uh, new territory with some exemptions for example uh, in 2014 but uh, generally it might be the regime change itself uh, not the uh, defeating uh, enemy army or occupation of uh, its territory and uh, when we speak about uh, military goal uh, as a regime change, we should understand that uh, uh, it's not necessary to change the regime by military means, by tanks or by artillery. Sometimes it's uh, enough just to find the right moment uh, uh, where it's a uh, good occasion to hit uh, by only a very minor force. Uh, the main message uh, of uh, my part is that uh, we should uh, focus not on the points but uh, on a vector. Uh, the way is not to reach just uh, one or two points in the future where we will declare that we uh, defeated uh, the enemy, but uh, we should understand that it might be a long time process uh, which has no end and uh, maybe uh, no beginning. Uh, just some practical remarks. Uh, uh, I think that uh, at least the military staff in this room understand uh, these abbreviations. Uh, we use them uh, uh, not only in military environment, uh, at least uh, the first one is uh, uh, very uh, famous in the business environment. Uh, but uh, when, when you look uh, on uh, the way how we use it, uh, it's something like that. Um, this is an example from uh, uh, intelligence uh, evaluation of uh, operational environment in Afghanistan. It's old one, so it's, it's not secret. Uh, but uh, uh, you can see that uh, it's quite complicated uh, and uh, uh, even it's uh, very useful and uh, all, of the, uh, uh, all the tools and instruments we use uh, to evaluate future operational environment uh, are quite complex and uh, they might be very useful. Very often uh, we use only just formal way uh, how to count uh, how many steps uh, we already evaluated, but in fact uh, it's uh, not useful uh, in uh, the, the general approach. So uh, what we suggest uh, is uh, not to complicate the complicated, uh, but uh, uh, when we uh, take uh, some uh, basic ideas from uh, uh, punctuated equilibrium theory, uh, it might be very useful to uh, use uh, all these uh, uh, basic principles uh, to evaluate uh, future operation environment uh, in a little different way uh, and uh, at least uh, in uh, some different approach uh, or, or let's say academic uh, uh, if not uh, approach then at least uh, style of thinking. Uh, all the uh, ideas and uh, theories mentioned by uh, professors uh, Barta and uh, Kovar might be put to uh, mathematics and statistics. And uh, believe me, when you when you compare all the uh, hard data from uh, long time periods, uh, it has sense. Uh, uh, another uh, another. Uh, uh, let's say tool how to use this theory is uh, on the slide, but uh, I will not lose your time uh, uh, with uh, with details. I will just uh, show what might be the example uh, how to use them. Uh, for example, uh, just uh, uh, three small points in this theory. Uh, you can uh, uh, have a look uh, on the declination of violence uh, in the world or in the specific area and it's clear that in the last 100 years uh, the violence really declined but on the other hand in the last uh, 30 years uh, you can see in the in the uh, uh, picture in the uh, left corner that the uh, great powers assertiveness uh, is uh, uh, really rising up very fast in the last uh, let's say 25 years and in every such situation in the, in the human history, uh, we can find so-called tukidite strap, uh, which is a, a situation when the new power is uh, getting up uh, uh, in the economic way, but uh, in the end, uh, in ha it might have uh, really very serious impact on the on the international uh, 
uh, in the international peace or in security. Uh, another example, uh, water, water security, fragile star index, uh, index and uh, men to uh, women uh, ratio, it might be another uh, good uh, example how to use it. But uh, you can use uh, all these uh, examples not uh, as a, let's say, uh, independent uh, instrument, but uh, it's a complex and uh, uh, when uh, uh, you uh, put it in the schedule like uh, this one, it may uh, show you very important uh, results. Uh, I'm sorry for being uh, really uh, very fast, but I think that uh, it might help. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so I put a couple of highlights uh, here. And these eight points are really major themes from uh, Professor Barta's previous work. It's from his uh, books and uh, presentations. And uh, from the very first time I met him during one of the seminars in Czech Republic, uh, and I saw his presentation uh, on collapse in, the so in society, uh, which uh, use the punctuated equilibrium theory. Uh, the very first time I, I've seen it, uh, it immediately struck me how many similarities I could see with the military. Basically, anything he was observing in our society, I could immediately imagine and see happening in our military. So I chose these eight points to provide some of my personal observations. The first one is crisis and collapse are integral to all systems, and that includes military and our way we conduct the war. While well, we are highly centralized, complex, bureaucratic, and hierarchical systems by nature, and as an organization, we are quite often resistant to learning and change. That makes it more difficult to predict and even uh, more difficult to admit crisis uh, when it's coming, and quite often even when it's already uh, underway. Moreover, we have built in problem with uh, admitting any kind of our own failure. It is... Basically, it's unacceptable for us to have a failure, and uh, that complicates uh, things further. While collapse is normal for any society, and therefore it must be normal for military, the problem is that collapse of military at war may have far-reaching consequences for our nation, and therefore crisis in our military affairs could be carefully man should be carefully managed. Well, because collapse comes in nonlinear way, uh, in leaps, and in uh, multiple uh, aspects at the same time, it is really important that we build our defense system simple, agile, and flexible, so we can be able to react and adjust to those sudden changes. Well, sadly, what we do is that we are building exactly opposite, rigid bureaucratic system, and we are adding to this with any change we introduce, at least talking for our military. We always tend to be surprised whether it was the peace support operations in the end of Cold War, counterinsurgency campaigns, or now with the return of Russian threat. But we are not able to react fast enough, and this applies to all the aspects, like our military capability development system, procurement system, that one is special in Czech Army, uh, mobilization system, which we pretty much destroyed in our country, strategic supplies, legislation, training, education, and so on. And it takes time to change these systems. Therefore, you need to build them flexible enough from the very beginning. We are bad in our predictions, but much worse in our reaction, and our often uh, discussed defense budget is a primary example. Well, it's even more challenging since there are no minor fixes to complex ch changes in our society and operation environment, because complex change is always required. Well, since collapse is a sudden loss of complexity, it is always preceded by huge growth in complex complexity of the effective system. I can see this in our military in every day, well, every day in every aspect of our life. This is also clearly visible in the way we conduct operations today. There's many examples, but I believe that the way we command and control in operations is a primary example. Even though we know about developments in both technology and doctrine in our potential adversaries, we are not able to reform the way we do business sufficiently. For example, and just one of the many examples I could use, 
is uh, if you look at the sensor to shooter timelines, which we can observe now in eastern Ukraine, used by uh, w when the Russian supported, well, Russia backed separatists use their uh, indirect fire. When we look at the timelines, they're able to conduct it, and we look at our inability to move on the battlefield and to move our uh, command posts and our command control nodes. Uh, that's that's just comparing minutes and hours, and we're still, you know, not able to do anything about it. And there's many examples like that. Uh, we can see the same with mission approval process, conops approval, information sharing, and many, many other aspects. Today it became a great fashion to use the expression mission command, especially in U.S. military, I noticed, uh, with my U.S. colleagues. And the problem is that quite often we don't understand what that means, and we don't really apply it properly. So we call everything mission command, but it's not really what the mission command means. Well... Energy return on investment was mentioned here before as another collapse factor, and I can clearly observe in our military uh, the, the impact uh, and how we spend more energy with a lesser income. Well, our aversion to risk culture and huge uh, sustainment requirements, uh, which we inherited from the last operational de deployments and campaigns, it only adds to the problem. As a major, I was once told by a three-star general who I was about to brief on the uh, concept of operations that wise men talk command control first, logistics second, and leave tactics in the end. What it means is, is really, it is really important uh, to be able to sustain our effort because that's what decides the war in the end. And, and our enemies and our potential adversaries, they know this very well. Uh, and as you can see here, Bin Laden certainly realized it and considered it, considered it in his planning, as well as Vladimir Putin knows it very well. And you can see here that they want to achieve intellectual superiority by asymmetric and less expensive way. So he, he knows what the energy return on investment is. Since there is no single factor causing the crisis and collapse, and that means there's no single solution, it's always the mixture. We have to ob observe and assess the system in its complexity, be it uh, operational environment or our own militaries. It's not about METC, as, as we soldiers know, it's a mission, enemy, terrain and weather, troops, uh, time available, civilians, that's, that's how we assess the, the, the mission. Uh, it's more about the PMISI and ASCOPE, what uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fulton was talking about before. We need complex analytical framework and long-term data for this, and that's where scientists come really useful. We also need complex capability development system in our militaries to be able to cope with whatever we find out. And this is one thing we really miss in Czech military, and I can see the consequences every day. Professor Barta tells us whatever factors bring us up and enable us to grow are usually the ones that will also take us down during the crisis and collapse. Well, bureaucracy and technology in warfare are good examples. It is what enabled us to be faster and able to handle more complicated stuff than the enemy. But now we are coming to the point where these same factors make us slower and overcomplicated. A good example, but again, one of many, uh, could be our inability to react adequately and fast enough to enemy false propaganda in Afghanistan and other places. Where enemy was using information technology we developed against us and we got so complicated in our command control and approval processes that we could not react effectively. Since the critical factors causing crisis and uh, collapse and change in the system are present and can be observed in it uh, from the very beginning, it is important that we think strategically, long term, not only here now. Our plan, refine, execute, assess approach, which we normally practice in our operations, is relevant here because what we really need is to assess the system all the time continuously from the very beginning when we start to design it. We cannot wait with our assessment and innovations and adjustments until we have developed in crisis. This must be proactive and preventive in nature. And we must start this right when we begin to design the system. 
Since prediction requires that long-term perspective and deep understanding, history can be a powerful tool to help us understand what's going on. There is no quick fixes to solve a crisis and manage a collapse in any system. A complex challenge requires always complex solution. When we try micromanage things, struggling for tight control and minor adjustments, we usually only add to crisis and speed up its development. The way to manage common crisis and collapse is to assess both internal and external environments from the very beginning and try to decentralize and make us as small, simple, and energy saving as possible. Unfortunately, often we in military and, our, and in our operations do exactly opposite. And I come to conclusion now. Well, the complex changes to warfare are coming. That, that's no question. And they will be coming again in future. <coughs> the punctuated equilibrium is a helpful conceptual framework to help us understand these developments and can serve as a prediction tool. We should reinforce our cooperation with social scientists and historians because we can only deal with problems when we understand the situation and how it developed. And social scientists and historians especially can help us to understand it. We should always strive to decentralize our system, keep it simple, and utilize the true mission command. And I would end up with the final quotation, it's a bit older, from Confucius, and it says that study the past if you would define the future. So I just want to <laughs> underline that the cooperation with the scientists, social scientists, and especially historians, is really relevant to our uh, development in military. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for your very rich and thoughtful, I think, uh, insights. And um, uh, obviously we can see how the bridge is being constructed between the academic and the social sciences and uh, the, the military and so on. Uh, again, I, I think we reached the point where we would like to take the opportunity to exchange some views with our distinguished uh, speakers. And uh, I would like to open first the discussion with our participants, if they want to make a comment or ask a question. And uh, we're also delighted that General Gray is with us. You cannot escape. <laughs> and we saw you, uh, that you, you came in. We're very grateful. and. We would like, uh, obviously, to invite you anytime you wish. Yes, please. I, I, I have to <coughs> tell you a story. Uh, in 1988, when uh, in 1988, when we were in the middle of the uh, strategic arms introduction talks with the former Soviet Union, we hosted their uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff from uh, Moscow. And of course, uh, uh, Field Marshal uh, Akramayov was the Soviet leader at the time under Mr. Gorbachev. And we took him to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, to observe an exercise. And while we were there, it was our policy to to put on an exercise and then let our visitor talk to the to the young Marines in this case. And we, we stayed back because we, we wanted them to just say what was on their mind. And so we did that, and Marshal Akramayov came back and through a translator said to me, you are deceiving me. I said, what? He said, you are deceiving me, General. You have officers uh, dressed in enlisted uniforms. And I said, Marshal, if I wanted to deceive you, that's the last thing i do because, as everybody knows, the young corporals and sergeants, they tell it as it is. The officers kind of put a spin on it, you know. And so he went back again, and, and he talked again. Then he came back, and he said, you know, if I asked Russian soldiers what I'm asking your Marines, the Russian soldiers would say, uh, they would say nothing. They would look at their boots. He said, your Marines speak right up. You can tell they were educated in a democratic environment. And I thought that was a, quite a statement from a marshal of the Soviet Union. 
So after I went up to the corporal that was talking to him last, I said, Corporal, did you talk to that Russian general? He said, yes, sir. I said, what did he ask you? And more importantly, what the hell did you say? And he said, uh, he asked me uh, why I thought they were there and, and all of that kind of thing. And I said, well, what did you say? He said, I didn't know why you were here, but I thought it was a pretty good idea. And that, <laughs> rushed, that corporal captured our strategy. And, and the, uh, but the reason I tell you this story is because when I heard uh, our, our general talk and the lieutenant colonel and the like and, and the other distinguished uh, scientists and, and, and gentlemen, I couldn't help but think that uh, we had uh, American generals in Czech uniforms because your, your uh, lecture could have been given by any general or admiral of the United States with exactly the same points as you make. All the business about uh, mission command, uh, over-centralization, risk averse, uh, being afraid to stand up, not turning people loose, all of that is exactly what uh, we need to change, change in our country and in the other Western countries that, uh, that desire to remain free. And so I thought this was a, a, great, uh, a great presentation today by all of you. You're, you're right on in terms of, uh, of what you're saying. And uh, in, in, in my own uh, uh, particular experience and like, that's what we've been preaching for a long time under this uh, maneuver thought process as a philosophy. We want to turn the people loose. We want to develop young strategic corporals and sergeants. We want to get the hierarchy out of the way and worrying about today's fight and tomorrow's fight, worry about the future. Uh, we used to say that we'd like to have strategic corporals and strategic sergeants. And what we mean is the, the whole establishment has, to, has to, to think about things. It's what you think about and all of that. And, of course, as you pointed out very eloquently, it's far more than just warfare. In fact, the military part is in many ways the simplest part of all. And, and uh, of course, our two uh, military speakers are are uh, more than, than experienced in special operations and that type of thought process, and that's the wave of the future. Uh, to think uh, that way, and and in special forces, that's what they do. They develop young people who think, and they think all the time, and that's what makes them successful in most cases. And so, on the scientific side and on the higher level. All these elements that our speakers brought out in this uh, equilibrium discussion, they're all important. And military, again, is probably uh, the easiest to understand in, in this complex world that we live in. So strategy is a never-ending thought process. It must be adaptive, and it must be, uh, uh, must be cover the entire spectrum of what you heard about today. So I think uh, this was just a great discussion. Now I'll get out of the way and let you take over. Okay. Do we have questions? Ask Yona and the, and the party. I don't answer Any questions. Any questions from uh, the audience? We have a few minutes. Our panelists, uh, would you like to, to have the last word? Um, can I turn it on? Can you, um, is that okay? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I should be the, the, the last um, last person talking here officially, but uh, um, again, uh, let me express how regretted you for having us here. It, um, at least uh, my impression is that it was a great, um, great seminar, though, to be frank and honest with you, uh, we would need uh, at least one full day to explain the nuances and uh, um, advantages of the punctuated equilibrium approach, both in um, society and military. But um, I think what what emerges quite clearly is that uh, military and um, science have many points in common, and uh, uh, there is no doubt about the fact that, that the the mutual cooperation should be much more intensive if the, in the future if, as General Gray expressed himself, we want to succeed in this um, more and more complicated and increasingly sophisticated and complex um, world because military is nothing 
exclusive. It's nothing that would exist far beyond our everyday um, borders and frontiers. It's the other way around. It's an integral part of our modern society. And if the military um, wants to be successful, and if our society wants to be successful, they have to mutually cooperate, they have to enrich each other, and they have to um, anticipate what's been, um, what's been happening all around us because the world is extremely dynamic and uh, what happened yesterday is a quite remote past if you look at it from our current um, point of view. So um, I'm convinced that um, such seminars, um, exchanges of ideas and opinions are uh, inevitable if we really want to succeed and uh, um, um, avoid uh, any major failure um, in the future, in particular because we are living in a, a huge global, huge global world and we are far from understanding all its nuances and uh, processes that we've been having in front of our eyes because very often what we see is not what we uh, what we get, and there are many nuances in individual processes and uh, um, elements uh, that we see, but we are not able to um, to process um, properly. So again, thank you very much, and it was my um, it was my honor um, being being here. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much again. Uh, <coughs> Uh, clearly, this is uh, the beginning, as we say, academics, and not the end of it. And um, I think scholarship and study can lead to some uh, action. I think what uh, basically, as academics, uh, at least some of us, uh, guide us uh, to, to questions. Uh, one um, or, or two considerations. One, what keeps us up at night? Uh, to, to worry about uh, their challenges. And uh, secondly, I, I think uh, the other um, guide line, if you will, is uh, basically what have we missed? And uh, it means uh, actually to continue to search uh, for identification of the various uh, challenges, as um, uh, Professor Barta, you uh, mentioned, for example, about the contributing factor of uh, climate. And here again, um, we can have to deal with Mother Nature and see exactly how to try to anticipate uh, the catastrophes Mother Nature, but at the same time, obviously, we have to look at uh, man-made, I think, um, catastrophes, and um, I, I believe that uh, we have to consider uh, not only the question of uh, technology, and I think you quoted in the beginning that uh, nothing is new under the sun, basically maybe technology, but at the same time, we uh, also have to deal with the uh, complexity of uh, human nature and how to uh, deal with that, particularly in light of recent developments, even the school sh shootings and so on. So I think the debate should continue, not only uh, on the national level, but on the regional and global. We want to thank you again and we'll continue the dialogue in the future. Thank you. Some, some of our publications that we yes, send it to you. Yes. But uh, what's the best way? Maybe we we'll give it we can to just the maybe go embassy. Over and to have a look. Yeah, to the embassy. Yeah, you want to come over and uh, look at it now or later? Or we can, we can uh, actually, we, we have a few things in your, uh, in the package here, but uh, I would be delighted. <laughs> Thank you to be, uh, you know, in touch uh, with you. And um, uh, as I said, your university 
our CEO contributed a great deal um, for, for decades and decades. And we, we had the chance, even during the Cold War, to, to have some uh, second track diplomacy, whatever you want to call it, with your, your people through the, um, the ICRC. Well, I visited my country two years ago. Really? Yeah, I have. And I respect the family. 